It's interesting to hear you um, comment um, on uh, the issue in Europe and Loa Lenu. Um, and uh, I, I also have the position of being co-chair of the um, World Zionist Organization uh, Department for um, Zionist Affairs in the Diaspora. And we recently had a worldwide meeting of heads of Zionist federations. And I have to tell you, coming from an American perspective, it was chilling to hear my colleagues speak about the limitations on their ability to act, to act publicly, to convene as we are today, and the threats under which they feel that they are operating. Um, so, so the issue of anti-Semitism, the devil that never dies, is, is certainly alive. It's well, um, well established uh, throughout the world. And the fact that, that we do not experience it as overtly as our, um, as our colleagues worldwide is a bracha, but it is something that we need to uh, think about very seriously. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, uh, Daniel uh, Jonah Goldhagen. Um, he is a prize-winning, internationally best-selling author, former Harvard professor, the author of The Devil That Never Dies, The Rise and Threat of Global Antisemitism. His books, which uh, I was amazed to, to learn, have appeared in 16 la languages, have been published to uh, wide acclaim. Uh, the most important book ever published about the Holocaust, uh, one of his works has been termed. Um, he's an author of many books. Um, he's appeared in many venues. He's had programs written about him, um, articles written about him. Um, he has written for newspapers and magazines across the globe, including the Times, New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Forward, the Sunday Times, the Guardian, the Zeit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he received his uh, degrees from Harvard University, his PhD, where he taught. Um, and I feel very privileged to introduce him today. As, as I mentioned to him earlier, um, I, I went to school in New York City in the 60s, and I was profoundly um, uh, influenced uh, by a wonderful professor of political science whose name was Dr. Eric Goldhagen, uh, our speaker's father. And um, if you look up his biography, he talks about he was, how he was influenced uh, by his father. And I, I want to tell you, so is I, and so are many of my colleagues. So it is really a pleasure to introduce you today. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction, and thank you all for being here. Um, though we have a very unpleasant topic f before us today. Um, and there, it's not only an unpleasant topic, but it's a vast, vast topic. And uh, I'm going to focus on the contemporary scene of anti-Semitism. So though it's entitled the devil that never dies, I'm not going to give you the historical, the historical material that has led to the resurgence of this devil during our time. But as I said, focus on what we see before us today. And there's a lot of confusion about contemporary anti-Semitism. Is it old? Is it new? Is it really just anti-Israelism, whatever that is? Or is it anti-Semitism? What causes it? Why does it have the, take the forms that it does, and so on? And some of these points I will address, but I want to, f if there are three things that I would like you to take away from this, they are the following. First, that there is such a thing as global anti-Semitism. Forget the new anti-Semitism, forget the old anti-Semitism. It's now become global, it's something different. We should see it for what it is, global anti-Semitism. It exists, and I'll tell you about its character. The second important point is that it has nothing to do with Israel. And the third important point is that it has everything to do with Israel. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Israel in its causes, and that's what I'll spend a lot of time talking about, and everything to do with Israel in its effects. 
And people have conf confused cause and effect, and they often do so willfully when they don't want to acknowledge the reality of anti-Semitism, what is producing it, and instead would like to blame the Jews, which is one of the oldest techniques there is, and in this case in particular, blame Israel. So those are the three big points. So let me start off by telling you that it is a very common belief in Europe that Jews have too much power in business. A very straightforward statement, Jews have too much power in business. It's so straightforward, in fact, that most people, I imagine, we don't really know, when they hear it, they kind of say, oh, well, I've heard that before. Jews or non-Jews, many non-Jews say, well, of course they have too much power in business, and so on. It's taken for granted as a statement about the world. In fact, about 50% of people in the European Union, or close to 250 million people, believe one version or another of this. It's an enormous number of people. Let's stop for a moment and think about what this statement might mean. What do people actually think when they say Jews have too much power in business? What are the Jews supposed to be doing with this power? Well, let's ask. If you say Jews have too much power in business, Obviously, you think that they're doing something nefarious with that power. Otherwise, you wouldn't say there's too much of it. It's not just saying Jews are do well in the economy. You could say that, and that would be true in certain countries. But they have too much power, so there's something threatening about it. So it's not such a simple statement. Why, we might ask, are Jewish businessmen and businesswomen seen as Jewish businessmen and businesswomen? Or as I should put it, why are businessmen and businesswomen who happen to be Jewish seen as Jewish businessmen and businesswomen? What are they doing that's different from non-Jewish businessmen and businesswomen, which is selling goods, making profit, earning money, and so on? This is what business people do the world over. A hallmark of anti-Semitism or of any kind of prejudice is to identify the object of your dislike, in this case that a person is Jewish, as being the source of or a characteristic of whatever else you're talking about about that person. It is utterly irrelevant to see Jewish businessmen and Jewish businesswomen as Jewish businessmen and women, yet that's how they're identified, a hallmark of anti-Semitism. We might further ask, how can people in these countries actually believe that Jewish businessmen and women have too much power when, in fact, Jews compose less than 1% of every country in the European Union and sometimes far, far less than 1% of the population of those countries. So what kind of fantastical view of these businessmen and businesswomen who happen to be Jewish do people have so that they see them as being too powerful and what are they imagining they're going to do or that they actually are doing with this immense alleged power of theirs of this tiny minority who are just trying to do what business people do? It's a very simple sentence, statement. Jews have too much power in business, yet it conceals so much or it has within it so much that tells us about how deeply anti-Semitic a very large portion of the European continent is, and how, furthermore, we shouldn't take such statements for granted. And what I'm suggesting is the first thing we have to do when apprehending anti-Semitism is learn to see again, because we don't see it. Statements come from the Arab or middle of the Arab or Islamic world or from Europe and pe that are anti-Semitic, or if said about any other group, would see as, be seen as blatantly racist, and we brush them off. Maybe not. I'm not saying all of you brush them off, but by and large, people brush them off. We have to be able to see them for what they are. Imagine if you were on a bus in New York City and you heard someone say, blacks are lazy, or Latinos are ruining the economy, or one or the other group has too much power in business. Your head would whip around and you'd think, this person's a racist. And when people say something that is actually far more damaging, or certainly at least as damaging, that Jews are threatening because they have too much power, we shrug. It's barely reported, even though it's believed by so many people. This, by the way, is both a new and old form of anti-Semitism. It's classical anti-Semitism. has nothing to do with Israel. This will be a phrase you'll hear from me again and again. It has nothing to do with Israel. If we move from Europe to the Middle Eastern world, we find that a common trope 
that is intoned again and again by political leaders, by religious leaders, by local imams, by people on the street and media of all kind, is that Jews are the children of apes and pigs. This has, uh, comes out of straight from the Quran and the Quran and the Quranic tradition, and it is one of the most frequently repeated tropes or phrases or sayings or ideas that you can find in the Middle East about Jews, Jews of Israel and Jews outside of Israel. This obviously is an ancient source of anti-Semitism, which has been activated and intensified over the last several decades in the context of the Middle East conflict, but it is an ancient, ancient anti-Semitic canard, and it is a form of dehumanization. It is robbing the people so being so described of their human qualities. It's quite blatantly dehumanizing, unlike many forms of dehumanization, which are not so blatant. Jews are the children of apes and pigs. If we move from the Middle East to the U.S. and Britain, we find that during the particularly during the run-up to the Iraq War and during the Iraq War, and also, of course, since then, it's been said again and again that there are cabals of Jews running the U.S. and Britain and duping their political leaders into, into war, undertaking a war and many other policies which are injurious to those countries. Now, this, of course, is a nonsensical idea. The idea that some Jewish cabal is manipulating take the United States the hard-bitten practitioners of, of realpolitik, of, of, of power politics, such as Rumsfeld, Powell, Cheney, and others. Forget about what you think about George Bush, but these other decision makers in the American, uh, in the American government of the time that were the ones, the engineers of the war, um, the idea that a Jewish cabal duped them into going to a war that they would not on their own have wanted to go to is, of course, on the face of it, nonsensical. This notion of the Jewish cabal manipulating the countries against the interests of those countries and their fellow citizens is not a form of dehumanization, but a form of demonization. That's not robbing Jews of their essential human qualities, but saying they are demonic in their ideas, in their political aspirations, and in their deeds. Now, if we move from Europe, the United States, the Middle East, to the rest of the world, we find astonishing numbers. In Brazil, 50% of the people are anti-Semitic. In Nigeria, 43% of the people are anti-Semitic. There are very few Jews in Israel, I'm sorry, in Brazil. It's a, they form less than 1% of the population. In Nigeria, there are virtually no Jews whatsoever. And in China, where there are also no Jews, a handful of expatriates, 55% of the people are anti-Semitic. This is according to the Pew, to a Pew International Survey. How is it that all around the world, and these are just symptomatic of many other countries which have similar numbers of anti-Semitic people, how is it all around the world that you have such high numbers of anti-Semites in country after country? Well, it's because the media, the public sphere, is polluted with anti-Semitism. And this is what people are exposed to. So, of course, they have negative views of Jews, unfavorable views of Jews. If we go back to Europe, it's not just these attitudes, and, and we don't know how profound these attitudes are in these countries, in China, Brazil. Brazil, we know more about China, Brazil, Nigeria, Japan, India, other countries. We don't know how profound they are, but in Europe, we know how profound the anti-Semitism is. It's so profound that not only are Jews exposed to their neighbors and their public spheres that are, that are harbor and, and anti-Semitism and spread the anti-Semitic notions around the country, but they also are themselves under assault, essentially under assault, which they themselves well know. And the consequence of that is that they're actually, they're, they're leaving their countries. They're leaving them as public Jews. They hide their Jewish identities. It's by now well known. They don't wear kippot, stars of David, and so on, and certainly don't want their children to do so for fear for well-grounded fear that sooner or later they will be attacked. Their institutions are bunkers, they're fortresses. And they're also fleeing their countries by emigrating to Israel and other places, and many more would like to emigrate, and probably will. There are many European Jewish leaders who think there's no future for Jews in Europe. And I 
share this view that in that with content with current trends within the next couple of decades Europe will be pretty much denuded of Jews or the surviving communities will be tiny and finally if we go to Israel we find that Israel faces something that no other country faces which which Jews in the past have faced before as no other people had previously faced which is an international eliminationist coalition think about it there's a coalition of countries and not to mention international organizations but more importantly countries which are devoted to the elimination of Israel through various means by the sword or by treaty or by pressure or one way or another they are devoted to its elimination there's no country in the world that faces an international eliminationist coalition now what I've done here is just giving you some highlights or if you want to see it that way lowlights of some of the instances or features of anti-Semitism around the world. But as horrifying, and I think it is pretty horrifying, as just these nuggets, if you want to call them that, are, they don't begin to give you a sense of the flavor and the passion, the flavor of anti-Semitism, what its character really is like, and of, and of the, the passion behind it, the images, and the effect upon people who, who harbor these views and of others who hear them or come across them. So let me just try to give you a little bit of that flavor. I'll read a passage that appeared in the media. Intoxicated mentally by the messianic dream of a greater Israel, which will finally achieve the expansionist dream of the most radical Zionism, contaminated by the monstrous and rooted certitude that in this catastrophic and absurd world there exists a people chosen by God, the Jewish people, and that consequently all the actions of an obsessive, psychological, and pathologically exclusivist racism are justified. Educated and trained in the idea that any suffering that has been inflicted or is being inflicted or will be inflicted on everyone else, especially the Palestinians, will always be inferior to that which they themselves suffered in the Holocaust. The Jews endlessly scratch their own wound to keep it bleeding. Think of that image. They endlessly, they willfully keep their wounds bleeding in order to arouse these passions in themselves, to make it incurable, their, their wounds. And they show it to the world as if it were a banner. Israel seizes hold of the terrible words of God in Deuteronomy, vengeance is mine and I will be repaid. Israel wants all of us to feel guilty, directly or indirectly, for the horrors of the Holocaust. Israel wants us to renounce the most elemental critical judgment. So Israel doesn't want anyone to use critical judgment. And for us to transform ourselves into a docile echo of its will. Israel, in short, is a racist state by virtue of Judaism's monstrous doctrines, racist not just against the Palestinians, but against the entire world, which it seeks to manipulate and abuse. Israel struggles with its neighbors, seen in that light, do take on a unique, and even metaphysical quality of genuine evil. A unique and even metaphysical quality of genuine evil. The quality that, di the quality that distinguishes Israel's struggles from those of all other nations with disputed borders, no matter what the statistics of death and suffering might suggest. Now if I told you this came from a political Islamic leader, I imagine you'd believe me. But as you may suspect, it didn't. This was penned by no one less than Nobel Prize winner in literature, Jose Saramago, and published in the New York Times of Spain, El País, in 2002. Ask yourselves, against what other people with such vile racism, bigotry, inflammatory accusations, incitement, against what other people would such a passage be published? By what Nobel Prize winner in literature, well, what, are the, what Nobel Prize winner in literature would even dare to think of publishing such a passage against another people than the Jews? Or, in this case, the Jews and Israel. And what, against what other people would a newspaper such as El Pais think of publishing such a diatribe, except against the Jews and against Israel? What does this tell us about the state of anti-Semitism? Now, what 
Saramago's passage is naked and brazen in its hatred, but he speaks the mind of much of the European elites, who might say, well, he goes a bit overboard, but would nod their head in silent assent to most of what he said if, as I said, they would like to water it down maybe just a little bit. And what you should note here also is the many different kinds of tropes that the many different kinds of tropes that are here that he brings together, if we had analyzed the passage, you would see them from different streams of anti-Semitism, leftist, rightist, Christian, political Islamic. It all comes together in this statement by Saramago. But the one thing that's missing from Saramago, and there's not much that is, is the call to violence. It's implied there. If you believe what he believes, then obviously you might, you might certainly countenance, if not say it's necessary to use force and violence to deal with such a, har a, har uh, a threatening and damaging foe such as Israel. But to get the more naked, and bloodthirsty, violent expression, we need to turn to p the political Islamic world where, it's, where it is rampant. Khala Khalad Mashal, the leader of Hamas, after the election victory in 2006, which led to Hamas's taking over of Gaza, confirmed that they have an unalterable plan to destroy Israel, which Hamas continues to maintain today. He said this in a chilling address after Friday's sermon in, in a Damascus mosque. And so to remember, this is now being said in a religious institution, a mosque. And it, it was aired on Al Jazeera television, so aired to the entire, in Arabic, to the entire Arabic world. After his speech about uh, Hamas's intentions to destroy Israel, among other things, his, wor his audience, the worshipers, were moved to interrupt him with a chant, death to Israel, death to Israel, death to America. And so then Mashal responded that, in a sense, death is not good enough. He said, death to Israel, death to Israel. I'm sorry, I mean, that's what they said. He said, before Israel dies, so before it dies, it must be humiliated and degraded. Allah willing, before they die, they will experience humiliation and degradation every day. So they must be tortured, essentially, and suffer so. Allah willing, we will make them lose their eyesight. We will make them lose their brains. What political leader would speak about what people in such a blood-curdling way, with such vivid, violent, and gruesome imagery as Mashal does about Israel and its people. And for that matter, who would do so, not only in private, but in public before worshipers and before essentially the entire Arab and Islamic world, except for political Islamic leaders? What does it tell us about the character of anti-Semitism in this world? And it's not just Mashal, even though that's enough, he's a political leader. And you should note that what is an uh, unusual thing about anti-Semitism compared to many other prejudices, and I'm a student of prejudice and not just of anti-Semitism, is we don't have to find kooks and cranks to quote to say, look at these terrible things people believe. All we have to do is go to the leaders of political movements of countries, uh, religious leaders, and we find them easily. It is an unusual feature of anti-Semitism uh, of anti-Semitism, that in today's world, the prejudices are spoken by the leading figures of the public sphere and politics of country after country after country. But it's also spoken in this violent imagery by ordinary people. As, you, as many of you, I'm sure, know, so-called suicide bombers, who should really be seen as homicide bombers, who really should be seen as genocide bombers, because they would effectively, they effectively say, any Jew has a, is fit to be blown up, and we would blow up as many as we can, including until there are no more. They record video testaments before they blow their victims up, which then get posted on websites, including Hamas's mm -hmm. website. So this was posted on Hamas's website shortly after Mashal made his speech. My message to the, to the loathed Jews is that there is no God but Allah. We will chase you everywhere. Notice it's Jews everywhere, not just the Jews of Israel. We are a nation that drinks blood, and we know there is no blood better than the blood of Jews. 
We will not leave you alone until we have quenched our thirst with your blood and our children's thirst with your blood. I ask the same rhetorical question. Imagine, imagine, think of, think of. It's just, it's just mind-boggling, but it's also not. It's the commonplace of a good part of the world. And if there's any doubt that they're speaking about Jews and not just about the Jews of Israel or Israelis, we can listen to Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, who for a time, as you know, was the superstar of the Arab and Islamic world for Hezbollah's resistance, deemed successful by them, to Israel's attack in Lebanon. And Nasrallah wanted to make it clear that in line with Hezbollah's own rhetoric, which, in which they speak of the Jewish state in a pejorative term instead of Israel or even the Zionist state. Jewish is deemed to be an epithet, and this is a commonplace of contemporary anti-Semitism, that Jewish is itself deemed to be an epithet. Nasrallah explained, if we search the entire world for a person more cowardly, despicable, weak, and feeble in psyche, mind, ideology, and religion, we would not find anyone like the Jew. Notice I do not say the Israeli. It's clear. The object of their hatred is first and foremost Jews. That they are in Israel, of course, in the middle of the Middle East, excites their hatred that much more, but it is for Jews themselves. Now, even though I've taken quite a number of minutes to lay this out, this is just nothing. If you want more, you can read my book or you can read many other books. There are many other good books on, on the subject that will lay out. And you can go, if you're interested in seeing video of this or of reading accounts, transcripts of this, go to the memory website, which, which contains a vast, vast accounting and depiction and reproduction of such anti-Semitism. Uh, and you will not, and it, it's instructive because you sit there and you watch these people who seem, they're not lunatics. They're consumed by hatred, they're consumed by ideology, but you see these educated, intelligent people speaking in a very coherent way but saying the most hateful and out of this world things about Jews. People don't want to know this stuff, they have their heads in the sand, they deny that it exists, they attack people who speak about it. Ask anyone who speaks about anti-Semitism, I can tell you, they attack you just for wanting to speak the plain facts about what is out there. And of course, they want to blame it all on Israel, which is the easiest way to avoid the subject, the real subject, which is global anti-Semitism. Now, one thing you should keep in mind, and if you can keep in your heads when I'm speaking, and, and which is important for thinking and understand, thinking about understanding anti-Semitism in general, when it, whenever you encounter it, is that the way out of some of the confusion about what anti-Semitism is, and I'm not going to give you a definition per se, and the confusion exists in part because there have, it has taken so many different forms over the ages, there's so many different accusations, so many different tropes, what's said here is not necessarily said there, and so how do you make sense of all and what really is anti-Semitism, is the way out of the this problem, and the thing that will, I think will help everyone think more coherently about it, is that whatever the differences among different forms of anti-Semitism and the way they're expressed in different accusations, is that there's something that is called a foundational anti-Semitic paradigm, which is pretty much always there except for in very mild forms of anti-Semitism. And it has five different f features to it. It holds that Jews are different from non-Jews. They're fundamentally different from non-Jews. It's not just that they happen to worship a different god. That they are fundamentally noxious. What form this noxiousness takes varies a great deal. That they willfully do harm is the third element. That they are powerful, whatever they appear to be, and therefore that they are dangerous. This is the foundational anti-Semitic paradigm. From Christian times to today, this is the core of anti-Semitism. How it's expressed varies a great deal on context and on the conditions of the time and what makes sense, but this is always there. 
And so we can rethink anti-Semitism through the ages by focusing on this paradigm and, and seeing the ways in which it has played itself out, or rather the ways in which anti-Semites have played it out. And if we did so, we would see that we've now entered the third era of anti-Semitism, the first being the long Christian era, the second being the modern racist era with its most horrific instantiation and expression during the Nazi period in Germany and in the colossal mass murder called the Holocaust. And now we've entered the third period, which is global anti-Semitism. And that's what I'll spend the rest of the time talking about. In global anti-Semitism, as I mentioned with Saramago, many streams of anti-Semitism have come together into a global amalgam. I'm not going to go into it here, but they one accusations in one area, uh, in, in one stream of anti-Semitism migrate to another, they come together, they find common ground, where in the past they were relatively distinct from one another. Christian and Muslim anti-Semitism, leftist and rightist anti-Semitism, they all intersect now. There's a global amalgam. I'll just give you one example of that. Uh, it is a common trope within the Palestinian Authority and in the Arab world more generally, and Islamic world more generally, that Palestinians are the new Jesus. Hmm. And that they are being crucified, they are being martyred, Palestinians as individuals, Palestine as an entity. There are many, many cartoons, caricatures of this kind. And this is just an obvious way to appeal to Christian anti-Semites in Europe and the United States and elsewhere for, to gain sympathy for the Palestinian cause. The Palestinians don't really care very much for Jesus per se, but he's a very useful uh, tool for them in trying to close the anti-Semitic circle and what they see as anti-Semitic noose around Israel. So it's global in the global amalgam. It's global in the numbers. I've already told you there are at least 250 million people in the European Union who are anti-Semitic by any reasonable understanding of what anti-Semitism is. In Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the number is probably in the countries where we have surveys, which is many of the major countries, major in the sense of largest population, is 1.5 billion people. And in the Arab and Islamic world, we don't really know because there aren't surveys. But in the countries that have been surveyed, Jordan, Lebanon, and Egypt, the number of people who are anti, who, who profess to be anti-Semitic are in the high 90s which are poll numbers that you find almost on no kinds of questions. It's really remarkable. You get poll numbers in the high 90s uh, for, for prejudice. It's remarkable. And there are 1.3, 1.5 billion Muslims in the world. And so if some large percentage of them, you have an enormous number of anti-Semites um, in, um, in Arab and Islamic countries. You have a world awash in, in, in anti-Semitism. Anti-Semites are everywhere. And they're in vast numbers. In both senses, it's global. As I've told you, anti-Semitism is not caused by Israel, no matter what people say. And I want to stress here that it doesn't mean that the Middle East conflict hasn't inflamed people's anti-Semitic notions. Of course it has. If you don't like Jews and you see what's going on in the Middle East, whatever exactly you think about Israel and its policies, it's very easy to say, there the Jews are doing it again. And to bring in real or imagined aspects of the conflict into your anti-Semitic litany. So of course the conflict has something to do with it, but, it, but fundamentally it is not causing it. Jews have too much influence in business, I've already told you. That has nothing to do with Israel. Half the people in the European Union believe this. Jews have too much influence in international financial markets. That means mainly Jews in the United States. Again, 40% or so of the European Union, 200 million people believe this. Nothing to do with Israel. Jews care only about their own kind. Has nothing to do with Israel. 200 million Europeans believe this as well. Jews speak too much about the Holocaust take advantage of it to get reparations and so on. Nothing to do with Israel. 40% of the people in the European Union, another 200 million people also believe that. Jews are guilty for the death of Jesus, the oldest and most damaging anti-Semitic trope and, and easily to argue the most damaging prejudicial statement of all time against any people. 100 million people in Europe believe this. And note, 
that, and when they say guilty for the death of Jesus, they mean are today guilty for the death of Jesus. And note that Europe is one of the most secularized regions in the world. And so it is a very large percentage of the people of Europe who actually are believing Christians. Nothing to do with Israel. In 2009, and this is very significant, and I'm surprised it has been brought out. I mean, you know, one office says no one has said this, but who knows? There's so much being said these days. There's so much media. You can't really follow everything. But I'm surprised this has not been emphasized. Um, the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, uh, there is vast, vast knowledge about what produced it, immediate knowledge. Endless reporting, hyper-focus on it, good information, not to say everything that was said was true, but we know about what happened, mortgage-backed securities, sovereign debt in Europe, and so on and so forth. And yet, 150 million people in the EU said Jews are responsible for the global financial crisis. It's really amazing. Despite all of the evidence, all of the reporting, they said, but behind it all is the Jew are the Jews. Nothing to do with Israel. It shows the depth of the profundity of the anti-Semitism of Europeans. If we move from Europe, I've already mentioned, Jews are the children of, Arabs and pig, of apes and pigs in, in, from the Quran. They betrayed Muhammad. They tried to poison Muhammad and kill the prophets, and so on and so forth. Nothing to do with Israel. Age-old, ancient, anti-Semitic notions. And even in the United States, where anti-Semitism is much lower than Europe, though it's also on the rise among young people and campuses and so on, it's a complicated phenomenon. I'm not going to go into it right now, how to think about anti-Semitism in the U.S., but its overall levels are much lower than Europe. I will say, though, that you know it, it, the reporting is hard. It's hard to frame it properly. So we say that anti-Semitism in the United States is only about half the level of Europe. Uh, and it's been in decline, but it's still a vast number of people. There's still tens and tens of millions of people who believe anti-Semitic tropes. If instead of saying only 20% of the people, only 15% of the people believe this, which sounds like not a lot of people, you think, you, if you say, well, the levels of anti-Semitism should be zero, because why should there be prejudice against, against Jews, particularly these kinds of damaging prejudices, and then you find that 45 or 60 or 100 million people believe this or that anti-Semitic notion, it's a horrifying number. So are things good here? Comparatively, yes. Are they bad here? In absolute terms, yes. So it's hard to talk in a coherent way the, and tell a full, give a full rounded picture of the state of anti-Semitism in the U.S. Uh, the dual loyalty charge, which does have something to do with Israel and which is very high in Europe, that is a very, subscribed to by very many people in Europe, 100 million people in the United States or 90 million people in the United States believe that Jews are more loyal to Israel than they are to the United States. Exactly what that means is never quite clear, but it's obviously a very damaging charge. Now, aside from these tropes having nothing to do with Israel, and these are the most common anti-Semitic tropes, or among the most common that exist, the notion that Israel has produced anti-Semitism simply does not map the data. There was a long hiatus in the public expression of anti-Semitism in Europe in the post-Holocaust period for decades until roughly, that is, in the public sphere. People believed and talked among themselves, but it was not part of the public sphere. You could, you could go for, really for years and not, not come across anti-Semitic statements in the media in many European countries or expressed by politicians or religious leaders. It started to a big up, uh, uptick in the 1990s and gathered steam in the 2000s, and here we are today, where it's really, there's a flood. Now, what is significant from the point of view of assessing Israel's role in this is that this resurgence of anti-Semitism in the European public sphere and in the world in general took place during the, high, during the, the years of the Oslo peace process when people were most optimistic in Europe and elsewhere that there would be a settlement of the so-called settlement, whatever it would be, of the Middle East conflict. So during the period when people were most favorably disposed towards Israel in Europe and around the world, you had this upsurge of anti-Semitism. It simply doesn't make sense to say Israel is the cause of it. It would not have occurred during that period. 
And also, if you look at a time where if you try to see if Israel's particular actions and conduct are responsible for an increase of anti-Semitism, you find that when there's data, it shows that it isn't. Operation Cast Lead in 2008-2009, Israel's incursion to Gaza, is, I think, pretty easy to argue, the single most vociferously condemned policy by the Israeli government of the last decade or two. It was almost universally condemned outside of Israel in the most vociferous terms, and it led to an enormous upsurge in attacks upon Jews, physical attacks upon Jews around the world. But we have polling data from b before and after this flood of, and of con condemnation of Israel. And what the polling data shows is that the underlying beliefs of Europeans did not move at all. In Germany, it went up one point. I don't, I'm not saying, I don't remember actually which country went up a point. I'll just say this. It went up a point in one country, down a point in another country, stayed the same in a third country. It essentially did not move. The underlying prejudice remained constant. If Israel were the cause of anti-Semitism, you would have seen an upsurge in anti-Semitic beliefs, and you saw none whatsoever. Yet another reason to think Israel is not the cause of anti-Semitism. Now, even if Israel is not the cause, even if what we have seen is a reactivation of, of what, what were essentially publicly repressed notions in the non-Arab and Islamic world and the bursting to the fore with the end of the Cold War of Arab and Islamic anti-Semitism and with the new media, which I'll say something about as well, even though Israel did not cause this, Israel the attacks upon Israel, what is called anti-Israelism or anti-Zionism, cannot be explained without anti-Semitism. And in fact, they are but obvious political forms of anti-Semitism. I don't see any way to see them otherwise. First, the most commonly used word to describe the people of Israel is not Israelis, and is simply Jews within the Arab and Islamic world. That's the term they use. They talk about Jews all the time. And even in Europe, where people are a little more careful about this, you f when studies show that, that among anti-Semitic letter writers and, and others, that anti-Semitic, classical anti-Semitic accusations and tropes are mixed in with, with anti-Israeli statements. They're, they're interwoven, intermeshed, mixed in together. They're inextricably bound to one another. There's no such thing, except for hypothetically, as anti-Israelism without anti-Semitism. You might even ask, what does it mean to be anti-Israel? I mean, there's no even, the, you know, anti-Germanism, anti-Frenchism, anti-Egyptianism. There's no, there are no categories for this. What does it mean to be against a country? It's a deviation. It, it, it is a linguistic and conceptual and emotional deviation from how people think and talk about really almost every other country in the world. So it doesn't even make sense as something aside from being a form of prejudice. The anti, the, uh, we could go through the anti-Israeli, the anti-Semitism that is focused on Israel and show that the structure and images and tropes are essentially the same as anti-Semitism, classical anti-Semitism in general, just dressed up in new forms. It's fantastical and singular in its nature. As I've already indicated, the things said about Israel are different. And what Israel faces is different from that of any other country, and what the Jew, how the Jews of the country are described is different from that of the people of any other country, certainly by, in, in widespread international terms. There are wild, wild accusations. One of the most commonly believed things in Europe, and certainly this is true within the Arab and Islamic world as well, is that Jews are conducting a war of extermination against Palestinians. Now, whatever you think about who's responsible for what in the Middle East conflict, and I'm sure there are a range of opinions here, and we don't need to go into it. The facts are that in the previous decade, Israel has killed about 6,500 Palestinians. It's a big number. Palestinians have killed about 1,000 Israelis. Also a big number. But however you judge this and whatever, there's no way that this can be seen as a genocidal assault or war of extermination. In fact, during the 20-year period prior to the handing over of Gaza by Israel to the Palestinians, Palestinian 
the Palestinian population under Israeli occupation doubled. If Israel were conducting a war of extermination, the Palestinian population would not have doubled, hardly a genocide. And in the 10 years prior to the handover of Gaza, the Arab birth rate, uh, under, uh, the birth rate of Palestinians under Israeli occupation in the territories was the highest in the world. Again, hardly a war of extermination. And yet 55% of people in the EU, 275 million people, believe Israel is conducting war extermination. This is simply a fantasy. It's a fantastical notion. It has nothing to do with reality. Their anti-Semitism is resistant to correction. You tell people this, it doesn't matter. They still believe it. They apply it to all individuals and Jews. This is an international form of prejudice, this anti-Israelism and anti-Semitism. And finally, in this vein, it's not just that there are these wild accusations against Israel. It's not just that the anti-Semitism has nothing to do with Israel. But as I've said, it has its real consequences, which are to be focused upon Israel. And in fact, Israel is described, is treated and described as no other country in the world. It is deemed to be a demonic country, really demonic, satanic, in quality. It is deemed to be dangerous. Europeans actually say it is the most, the greatest threat to world peace of any country in the world. That's how dangerous it is. Again, another fantastical notion. It is utterly delegitimized as a country in the eyes of anti-Semites. It faces a kind of denialism, which I will elaborate upon in a moment, denialism, denying its many of its central aspects and features that no other country faces in almost any of its features, let alone in all of them. It is confronted by an international coalition which would love to destroy it, and it is essentially treated as the devil among nations, as Jews are treated as, have historically been treated as minions or allies of the devil, as devils in human form. Now, just to focus for a moment on the denialisms, and this is really a remarkable catalog of things. You all have heard of Holocaust denial, the notion that the Holocaust did not take place, or ways that minimize it to say, well, if Jews were killed, it was a smaller number, and so on and so forth, or maybe the Jews did it to themselves, or responsible for, for provoking Germans and others to kill them, and so on and so forth. You've all heard of Holocaust denialism. But there are many other forms of denial, and, and that's just a form of anti-Semitism. It's easy to show that it is, but I will leave that aside for now. Israel, faces ma Israel and Jews face many other forms of denialism, which have not been as focused upon. Some of these have been mentioned and described, but it's quite a catalog. There's, a, there's Israel denial itself, the notion that Israel even exists. It's not that it is something other than a Zionist entity, its proper name has often not been used and still is not used by many. Israel is not a real country, and it doesn't exist. There's Bible denial. The notion that the Jewish Bible is the Jewish Bible is called into question, particularly in the Palestinian Authority, or that Jews are the custodian of their own sacred tradition is also a very common notion. There's history denial. The notion that Jews are historical people who have been in the land of Israel in ancient times and throughout is denied. There's temple denial. The notion that the Temple of Solomon existed or was on the Temple Mount is routinely, roundly, daily, on a daily, if not daily, a virtually daily basis denied by, in the, Pal by the Palestinian Authority and its officials, and many, many others. There's Jerusalem denial. The notion that Jerusalem was the holy city of the Jews is follows from the temple denial, that it was the ancient capital of the Jews, and so on and so forth, that Jews have any historical presence and right to be in Jerusalem. This is a very a very focused form and, and, and frequently intoned form of denialism. The, there's Dead Sea Scrolls denial, perhaps not the most major of all the denialisms. The notion that they had anything to do with Judaism or Jewish sects is denied. There's Jesus denial. It is a very, very common, as it, within the Palestinian Authority, to deny that Jesus was a Jew. And he is treated as the first Palestinian martyr. This, of course, picks up on what was 
a centuries-long practice in Europe, uh, in medieval Europe, to deny Jesus' Jewish origins. In fact, for centuries, the church concealed it, the Catholic church and other churches concealed it or didn't discuss it, and not just for centuries in medieval time, but in modern times, so much so that a very prominent uh, Catholic writer uh, who was very prominent told me, and in fact, I think he's written about it, that when he was uh, a child growing up in the 1960s, that he did not know that Jesus was Jewish, even though he grew up in a very, very Catholic family and eventually went into the seminary himself. There's people who deny the notion that Jews are a people rather than some collection of riffraff or so on, is denied, and therefore they don't have the rights of other people, which would be the right to a country. There's humanity denial. Jews are the children of apes and pigs. The, hu the, the, the very humanness of Jews is denied. There's the right to life denial. As you've heard, Jews don't have right to life in, in, in the eyes of many of the political Islamists. And there's anti-Semitism denial, finally, which is the notion that there is anti-Semitism is routinely denied, and people who say that there is are routinely attacked. Israel and Jews face a panoply of denialisms, the likes of which no other people and no other country face. Most of them don't face any of these. Some of these don't appear for any other people, and certainly in their, in their sum, there's nothing like it. So this is what Israel faces. These are the consequences of anti-Semitism. This is the political expression. And we have this expression, this anti-Semitic expression, so forcefully focused on Israel for two reasons. One is because in much of the world, it's still not legitimate to attack one's country's own, own Jews in classical forms. You might believe Jews have too much power in business, but you won't really read it in the public sphere, if a politician would come out and start saying these classical anti-Semitic things on a regular basis, certainly in Europe, it would cause an uproar and it would lead to trouble. But what is legitimate is to attack Jews abroad. This is a different, a new feature of global anti-Semitism. It's global. You can attack international Jews, Jews in Israel, Jews in the United States who are allegedly manipulating the, uh, the superpower of the United States, but you can't, not in all countries, but in most non-Arab and Islamic countries which don't have Jews, you can't attack your own country's Jews in classically anti-Semitic forms. So Israel is an outlet for anti-Semitism. The second reason Israel is the focus of anti-Semitism is there is nothing which incites the passions and animus of anti-Semites than the specter of Jewish power. If you hate people, nothing makes you more concerned, more worked up, more worried, more in fear, than the notion that they actually have power. And Israel is obviously a country well capable of defending itself, a regional superpower, a powerful country in local terms. And it is, and it is a symbol of Jewish self-assertion and power in the world, which is different from the life of Jews in the diaspora for hundreds, indeed for thousands of years. And so that's another reason that anti-Semites have focused so much of their fire on anti-Israelism. There are still others, but those are the two principal ones. And finally, to wrap up about global anti-Semitism, it's not just that we have a global amalgam where streams come together, that, it, that you find anti-Semites everywhere in the world, that you have such vast numbers of anti-Semites, but also it is literally everywhere in the world because it's all over the internet and all over digital technology. You can a few clicks and you get to anti-Semitism very quickly. Type the word Jew into your browser if you haven't done it. It's a shocking experience. The number two or three or four site, depending on whether you're in Bing or Google or what the day is, that will come up is something called Jew Watch or Jew Watch News. And it is, a, it is a supermarket, an emporium of anti-Semitic hatred. They claim to have 1.5 billion pages. Who knows how many they have? But certainly they have an enormous amount of anti-Semitism, well categorized with all kinds of headings or categories, including Zionist occupied governments, Jewish genocide today and yesterday, Jewish leaders, conspirators, power lords. These are just the categories. Jewish atrocities, you can click on any of these and you have vast amounts of things that come up. Jewish banking and financial manipulations, Jewish communist rulers and killers, Jewish mind control mechanisms, you know, think of the range of things and the craziness. Jewish hate hoaxes, Jewish criminals, Jewish oppression of Gentiles, Jewish Christian murders, and on and on and on. Think of an innocent kid who says, what is this about Jews, or I want to learn about Jews, and he types in Jew and this is what he reads. And th or think of an anti-Semite who wants to learn more about what's going on today, 
or his views deepen, he types in Jew, and this is what he gets. And it's not just Jew Watch. There are thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of such sites. And there's, of course, satellite and digital media of all kind that are, that are spreading and offering anti-Semitism around the world at, any, at every moment. So it's everywhere, a few clicks of the way, a few clicks away. One thing that is different about anti-Semitism today is that the images are more violent than in the past. The stealthy Jew of the past, Shylock of medieval times, powerful Rothschild of modern times, has morphed into Rambo today because Israel is powerful. Anti-Semitism always takes on the idiom of the age, and Israel is a powerful country and engaged in conflict. And so the images from the conniving string-pulling Jew behind the scenes has morphed into the Jew, the Jewish <coughs> Rambo marauder with his foot, foot on the throat of the Palestinian child. So that's a different feature of global anti-Semitism. It's more deadly than ever, and which is, a, which is quite a lot to say given what the Nazis, what the Germans did during, this, during the middle of the last century. It is Nazi-like. What you read in Hamas's charter, you should read the charter, it's, it's eye-opening. They've affirmed it again and again. What you hear in the Arab and Islamic world, what you can see on video, what you can read in their newspapers, is more openly, violently, murderously anti-Semitic than the Nazis ever were in their public pronouncements. They're more, more blood-curdling blood imagery than you will ever find in Nazism. I say this as an expert on Nazism. I've written a lot about it. I know what I'm talking about. It is really just, if it did not exist, you would find it hard to believe that the public spheres of any country would be so polluted, so rife with such violent and blood-dripping hatred. And of course, this bespeaks what many people would love to do to Israel and to Jews in general. If you see what's going on in Syria, can you really believe that if the same people could conquer Israel, or we get their hands on nuclear weapons, that they wouldn't do the same or worse to the Jews of Israel and Jews beyond if they could? Again, another rhetorical question that answers itself, I think. And finally, anti-Semitism today is global in another respect. We live in a global age, which means that we understand that the world is a political world where politics influences virtually everything that goes on in the world, from economics to culture, to policies of all kinds, to the relations among groups. And anti-Semitism has become, as never before, hyper-political. It is part of the domestic policies of country after country to spread anti-Semitism, governmental policies, and of their international relations and foreign policies. Anti-Semites have captured the United Nations and other international institutions. And there is this international political coalition. There has never been such a thing before that is anti-Semitic and against and set out to destroy Israel. So we live in a global age, it's a political age par excellence, and anti-Semitism has become a political instrument as never before. So anti-Semitism is back, it's more widespread than ever, it is more powerful than ever. Fortunately, Israel is and the Jews are more powerful than ever and they can defend themselves. If not for that, who knows what would happen. And still, whatever we think about the current administration and what's been happening lately, the Israel still has a powerful friend in the United States, and the Jewish community here is still willing to defend its interests and put them forward. And their interests include, of course, the interests of people, the, the rights of people around the world, including the rights of Jews to, be, to remain alive and to live in safety in Israel. Israel is a target, not the cause of anti-Semitism, but that anti-Semitism is both old and new. It's the devil that never dies. It's just that the devil has gone global now. Thank you. Um, you want to speak? First of all, I hesitate to say thank you. <laughs> Um, but, but really, quite, quite extraordinary. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for questions, and let's make them brief and questions. First hand up. Okay, thank you. Wait a minute.
you've made a very chilling uh, talk here this morning, but isn't there also in the world, whatever you want, isn't isn't there also in the world of philo-Semitism? I uh, was in Finland at the time of Operation Cast Lead, and I saw in the newspapers, which are not only in Finnish but in English, a spontaneous demonstration in the capital saying that Israel has a right to defend itself by about 200,000 Finns. Um, the, you know, there, there are, of course, people, and particularly in this country, who support Israel very strongly and its right to defend itself uh, in a variety of ways, not just during op Operation Cast Lead. You know, and that's great. But that shouldn't be extraordinary. I mean, a country being attacked, everybody would, any other country being attacked, people would say, fine, of course they should defend themselves, and we wouldn't make a big deal about it. So, of course, there are, as a minority around the world that recognizes Israel's right to defend itself when rockets are being shot in, at Israel on a daily basis, we all know the question, what would happen if from Mexico, let's say, they started shooting rockets over the border? Can you imagine how the U.S. would respond? So we should take that as normal. What is not normal, what is, what is extraordinary and which I've been speaking about, is the vast majority of people who take the opposite position. So we should be happy that, that Israel has friends, even in Europe, and many in the United States, but let's recognize that this does not negate or cancel out all the anti-Semitism. And also, it shouldn't, it's not something to be celebrated. It should, it's, it's not extraordinary in the context of the way the world ordinarily works. We should, take, we should thank, be thankful for it, but not make too much of it. How do you respond to President Perez, who says that there are countries through the world with hundreds of millions of people who don't know Jews and are fundamentally not anti-Semitic, but you sort of counter that by saying many of those countries are deeply anti-Semitic in your surveys? Um, you know, it's again, it's the same question. What matters more, that there are 45% of the Chinese who don't have an unfavorable view of Jews? That's great. Why should anybody have an unfavorable view of Jews? Uh, uh, but 55% of Chinese do, which means, and you know, again, as I said, we don't know how profound these views are because the surveys didn't go into any depth uh, on the character of their beliefs. Um, you know, the glass half full, glass half empty phenomenon is, or people can, Perez and I, I guess, would disagree on whether this is half full or half empty. Um, if you take as a baseline the amount of prejudice that exists for other peoples around the world and then compare what exists for Jews, it is unbelievably disturbing. Let's take Lebanon, okay? Lebanon had a civil war for years and years and years. A country of four million people, about 100,000 people were killed. A civil war between Christians and Muslims. Everybody lost relatives or close friends. Everybody was touched. The country was virtually, was almost destroyed. Survey asked Muslims in Lebanon if what their views of G Christians are and their views of Jews. I forget, 97% of them said they had, that they had unfavorable views of Jews. Israel has done nothing in Lebanon compared to what the Christians, uh, compared to the conflict that existed in the Civil War. Only 14 to 17% of Muslims said they had an unfavorable view of Christians. So even real conflict does not produce the kind of prejudice that exists as a routine basis Again, uh, for for Jews. So, yeah, let's be happy that not the whole world is anti-Semitic, but I don't think we should be so happy that that the number of people in countries where there are no Jews who are anti-Semitic is as high as it is. Why should uh, Lebanese Muslims have a favorable view of Jews, or why should there be zero anti-Semitism in the United States? The, why should the European uh, know that only 6,000 Palestinians have been killed? The, the facts don't come to them. The media is the vehicle for the facts. And the media has uh, bought into a propaganda campaign uh, that has been going on in the 
the uh, Arab world, and uh, after the 73 war, the Palestinians have become the victims, and the media has been picking this up and is the oxygen for all of this, and the Muslims obviously have been picking it up. There's a billion of them, and there's 16 million of us. So why shouldn't, why, how, how, why shouldn't there be a, 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 a campaign that we can fight against uh, that has been initiated by the Arab world very successfully, picked up by the media, and that would explain a great deal of this anti-Semitism, particularly in places where there are no Jews. Yeah. One more question on this side. Yeah, it's, uh, I just wanted to ask, the, uh, you talked about an alliance uh, against Israel and against Jews. Why is it that we cannot create an alliance for Israel, an alliance to fight the misinformation? I say that because I come from Africa. I have worked all around Africa. And there are many countries that are favorable to Israel, but there is no effort to bring these countries together in a group that fights the group that is against Israel. Um, as, to, as to the causes of anti-Semitism, I fully agree with you that the, the world media is inundated with with anti-Semitic, more overt or less overt uh, notions, and that there's, and that there really is in most of the world no counter-image of Jews or of Israel available, um, and so, as you said, why should they believe otherwise? I, I fully agree with you. There's a lot to be said about the causes of anti-Semitism and why the resurgence has occurred and why it's taken the form it has, which I haven't gotten into, but there is no doubt that the that the major the major source of anti-Semitism is the public cultures, both local and regional and national and now international, that people grow up in. After all, most anti-Semites, not just today, but historically, have never known Jews. In the Arab and Muslim world, most anti-Semites have never met Jews or knowingly met Jews. And that's been true historically. And so what people know about Jews, or what they think they know, is what they're taught or what they hear or what they come across. And in today's world, while before it was mainly through religious leaders in local communities, today it's mainly through the media in one way or another. And the media itself, you know, we talk about this abstract thing called the media. It's composed of people, obviously, and they have their beliefs and their interests. And many of the, and they spread these views both because it's in their interest to do so, but also because they genuinely believe these kinds of things. And so it's not so easy to deal with the media. You can't just turn a switch because, you, because the people who, who are the purveyors of these kinds of notions are there and are, will still be there. As to uh, an anti-Semitic anti alliance or a pro-Israel alliance, the, uh, again, there's much to be said about why the politics of the world have turned the way they have against Israel. But uh, one of the things that would certainly be at the, at the core of any analysis is that there is a very large Islamic and Arab international power block in international institutions, including in the UN, and they have made it, they have made it an, uh, a sine qua non of cooperation with them, of getting their votes and getting their support for things that other countries sign on to the anti-Israeli agenda. And there are many countries which are sympathetic in Europe to it because of all the anti-Semitism, but some of the other countries where the people don't care or don't or it doesn't even make sense to them, it's not worth it to them to fight this this anti-Israel block that is so powerful in international institutions. And there is no there is no great passion for Israel, even if they don't think badly about Israel. And so it's just e much much easier politically and practically to go along with the anti-Israel anti international politics than it is to buck the trend. And really, the only countries that do are, of course, Israel and the United States. And occasionally, you know, Canada has been good lately. And other countries occasionally sign on to certain things. It's just not worth it. That's the way international politics is organized now and will be for the foreseeable future. So thank you all. I'm, so, I, I'm going to stay around. <laughs>